In this example, we need to determine if the assets or liabilities are identifiable in terms of IFRS 3. You will remember from our IFRS 3 lecture that I've indicated when we look at an intangible asset. First, it has to meet the definition of an asset based on our conceptual framework rules. Very important, plus the recognition criteria. Remember, our recognition criteria includes that it has to be probable and reliably measured. And important, it has to meet the definition of an intangible asset in terms of IS38. Now, what is this definition in terms of IS38? First, it has to be identifiable. Second, it should be not physical substance. Therefore, normally you will not be able to see this. And third, it should be non-monetary. Now, guys, what is identifiable? This will be either when it meets the separability criteria or the contractual legal criteria. Now, RFRS 3 indicates to us that we only have to comply with the definition of our conceptual framework. We do not have to comply with our recognition criteria and the definition of IS-38. Therefore, guys, if we comply with this, we may recognize an intangible asset separately from goodwill. Now, what does it mean to recognize this separately from goodwill? In our net asset value, remember this is where you include your share capital, your retained earnings, if there's any fair value adjustments on your land, your assets, and so forth, then you can add your intangible asset as a separate line item. And these amounts, you will remember, will agree with your analysis of owner's equity. X Limited acquired 75% interest in Y Limited on 1 July 2017 in a business combination. Now, Y Limited has a three-year agreement to supply goods to Z Limited. Guys, do you see that there's three parties? X Limited, Y Limited, and Z Limited. X Limited will be the parent, Y Limited, the subsidiary, and then there is an additional agreement to supply goods to Z Limited. Therefore, the question will be, if this agreement is an intangible asset that should be recognized separately from goodwill. Both X and Y believe that Z will renew the supply agreement at the end of the term of the current contract. Therefore, guys, if they believe they will renew this, this is a three-year contractual agreement. Therefore, if this is a contractual agreement, do you agree with me that we can recognize this separately from goodwill? Then, in addition, this example indicates that there is a customer relationship agreement between Y and Z. Now, guys, I'm going to be honest. I would like them to provide you with a bit more information. However, if there is a customer relationship agreement that you will be able to identify based on the information provided that is established through a contract, you will be able to identify that this meets your contractual criteria and if it meets the contractual criteria you can recognize this separately as an intangible asset from goodwill in the next scenario x limited acquired 75 percent in y limited on 1 july now y limited has an assembled workforce now guys an assembled workforce is the employees of the entity the workforce which is an existing collection of employees that permits X Limited to continue to operate all its operations. Now, guys, do you think that we can capitalize our employees? No, very important. We cannot capitalize our employees. We cannot capitalize intellectual capital. 
and this is explicitly excluded in value placed on assembled workforce shall be submitted into our goodwill. Therefore, guys, this will not be included in a separate line item in the calculation of our net asset value. Now, our contingent liabilities. And you will remember from our lecture that we have indicated, guys, that first we need to meet the definition of our conceptual framework and start with a normal liability. We then need to meet the recognition criteria. Our recognition criteria indicates that it has to be probable and it has to be reliably measured. Now, remember that this will be in the separate financial statements of either your parent or your subsidiary. But IFRS 3 indicates to us that we only have to meet the definition of our conceptual framework and then important guys that it has to be reliably measured. It does not have to meet the recognition criteria of probability. They indicate to us that Conti Limited is acquiring all the shares in Liabi Limited on 1 July 2017 for 1 million. Conti Limited is aware that the subsidiary has disclosed a contingent liability. Now guys, let's just quickly discuss a contingent liability. Remember that a contingent liability will not be presented in this statement of financial position. Why not? Because a contingent liability is an obligation with uncertainty. Therefore, if there's uncertainty, guys, we cannot comply with our recognition criteria of our conceptual framework. Therefore, we cannot recognize an asset or liability. But we can disclose this. Now, to disclose it is to include a paragraph in your notes for the reader to be able to identify that there is a contingent liability. Therefore, there is uncertainty that something might or might not happen. And they indicate to us that the fair value will be 100000 for a claim against the company and has consequently factored this matter into the purchase price. Now, remember, guys, the contingent liability we can now recognize in terms of our forest three, but not in our separate financials. Therefore, the contingent liability shall be recognized separately from our goodwill. Now, again, what does it mean to recognize this separately from goodwill? We will include this as a separate line item. The consolidated journal entries will be as follows. We need to recognize the contingent liability. Therefore, we credit contingent liability. Our elimination journal, we will have to take out the investment. Therefore, we credit our investment. Guys, remember, our equity will be share capital, your retained earnings, revaluation reserves, and so forth. And we need to calculate our goodwill. Now, let's be honest, there's not sufficient information to include all of this relevant details. I want to focus on the following. If our year end is 30 September for both companies. In case one, they indicate to us the court case in respect of the claim has progressed to such an extent that it is now virtually certain that Larby Limited will have to pay 150,000. Important guys, if we now apply our IS 37 rules, it meets the definition as well as our recognition criteria. Therefore, in the separate financial statement of the subsidiary at year end, we may now recognize a provision. Now, guys, important, this is in the separate financial statement of our subsidiary, and we will debit the expense in our profit and loss, and we will credit a provision to the amount of 150000 Now, what happens? In our group, remember we've already recognized a contingent liability at acquisition date of 100,000. 
what happens in our group financials. FRS3 indicates that this contingent liability subsequent measurement. Now, what is subsequent measurement? This is at reporting year end, our subsequent measurement should be at the higher of one, the IS37 provision or the actual amount recognized, the 100,000. Therefore, guys, the higher will be the amount of 150,000. Now, if we consolidate, remember, we will add all of the assets and liabilities of our parent plus all of the assets and liabilities of our subsidiary plus minus our journal entries and this will be our group assets and liabilities. Now guys, in the separate records of our subsidiary, we have already recognized this provision liability to the amount of 150,000. Therefore, when we prepare our group, we will have a liability line item, provision 150,000. And due to our first journal entry, guys, relating to the 100,000 contingent liability, we have another 100,000. Therefore, do you see, when we perform our consolidation, we will state this liability incorrectly. We only need to state this at the 150,000. Therefore, we will have to reverse this 100,000 transaction. And to reverse a liability, we will then debit the contingent liability and credit our profit and loss. 